that nominates people shareholders should be able to, and they haven't gotten in very far. Roger Lowenstein with uh, Bloomberg Businessweek. Thank you for your time. Thank you. That does it for today's Washington Journal. Live coverage of the House begins now. The Speaker's Rooms, Washington, D.C., February 29, 2012. I hereby appoint the Honorable Rob Woodall to act as Speaker Pro Tempore on this day. Signed, John A. Boehner, Speaker of the House of Representatives. Pursuant to the order of the House of January 17, 2012, the Chair will now recognize members from lists submitted by the majority and the minority uh, leaders for morning hour debate. The Chair will alternate recognition between the parties, and each party will be limited to one hour, and each member, other than the majority or minority leaders and the minority whip, limited to five minutes each. But in no event shall debate continue beyond 11.50 a.m. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Dreyer, for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, uh, what I'm uh, about to announce will not come as much of a surprise, but we all know that this institution has an abysmally low approval rating, and the American people are asking for change in Congress. And so uh, I'm announcing today that I will leave the Congress at the end of this year. Now, I uh, take the unusual step of announcing it from here in the well of the House because I am a proud institutionalist. I believe that this institution is as great as it has ever been. And, Mr. Speaker, I announce it from here because between the Rules Committee upstairs where you serve with me, Mr. Speaker, pro tem, and uh, the House floor, this is where the people of California sent me to represent them. Now, as we look at the, uh, the challenges that lie ahead, they are very, very great. Uh, I deliberated over this decision uh, and I have to say that uh, three years ago I contemplated leaving at the end of that Congress, but ultimately made a decision that I wanted to uh, continue to serve through this term. And I wanted to do so in hopes that we would win the majority with um, a goal of pursuing the four-point pl platform that I had always run on, that being the pursuit of a free economy, limited government, a strong national defense, and personal freedom. And, Mr. Speaker, I wanted to work with not just my Republican colleagues, but my Democratic colleagues as well, working in a bipartisan way to accomplish a number of things. First, it was absolutely essential that we do everything to end the course that we had been on that ultimately brought us an 82 percent increase in non-defense discretionary spending. And I'm happy to say that we've turned the corner on that. Second, after years of languishing, we were finally able to pass three trade agreements that will create good jobs for union and non-union workers in this country by virtue of having passed the Panama, Colombia, and South Korea free trade agreements. I also believe that it's very important for us to recognize as we look at our national security the notion of people all over the world who are seeking to determine their own futures has created a wonderful opportunity for us and the House Democracy Partnership, another strong bipartisan organization, has just now partnered with its 17th country in Central Asia to help the legislative bodies strengthen and have the kind of independence and oversight of their executive branch that we have a tendency to take for granted here. And fourth, Mr. Speaker, I felt very strongly, again working in a bipartisan way, that it was essential to ensure that both Democrats and Republicans have the opportunity to have their ideas heard through their amendments on the floor of the House of Representatives. Now, I do believe, again, Mr. Speaker, that this is the greatest deliberative body known to man. We've got a great deal of work that lies ahead throughout this year. Uh, but I'm looking forward to following the Madisonian directive that members of Congress, after serving here, should go out and live with the laws that have passed. And I will say that uh, as passionately as we've been pursuing a pro-growth, jobs-creating agenda, I look forward to doing that myself as I uh, move into uh, the private sector next year. And Mr. Speaker, um, I will say that I want to express my appreciation. I want to express my appreciation, Mr. Speaker, to lots of people. Uh, of course, the, um, the volunteers, family and friends, supporters, 
and uh, the people who've offered prayers for our country on a, on a regular basis. And I also want to, most important, uh, express my appreciation, Mr. Speaker, to um, the, the people of California who, back in 1978, when I was 25 years old, living the dormitory at my alma mater, Claremont McKenna College, they gave me the nomination to, uh, for my party. And uh, it's been a very, very exciting time. And I also want to say, Mr. Speaker, that I express my appreciation to the very, very dedicated public servants in my office in California and my offices here in Washington for their commitment to do the best job possible to uh, help me represent uh, the people of California. And with that, I yield back to balance my time. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, uh, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank minutes. you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, Senator Olympia Snow announced that she wouldn't run for re-election. Not that she couldn't win, but that she didn't want to. Not in this environment. Uh, this storied representative will be a loss to the institution here. But it doesn't have to be that way, Mr. Speaker. This week on Capitol Hill, we have friends who've joined us from the public broadcasting community representing television stations, public television stations across the country. Today, the Women's Garden Club of America are here in force. Now, these are people that have an approach that can help us unwind the problems that we have here in Congress. Public broadcasting is America's voice. And for most of America, it's the only locally owned and managed source of news and local interest. It's commercial free. It is focused on our kids, our culture, our environment. Last year, amidst the Tea Party effort to defund public broadcasting, uh, we had a poll that showed 78% of Americans wanted the funding to remain the same or be increased. Two-thirds of Republicans wanted it to be held steady or increased. Now, this year's budget hopefully appears that we've dodged that bullet. Maybe some people have come to their senses. Americans were heard from coast to coast, don't play games with public broadcasting. We've got a few minor holes in the president's budget, but I hope we can come together in a bipartisan way, listen to Americans, listen to these representatives, and do it right. With the Women's Garden Club of America, we have a group, primarily women, who are focused not just on a garden club, but a fight for civic improvement through the connection to nature and to one another. Their work in policy is broad and deep. Their position papers on supporting clean air, clean water, climate change, public lands, take issues that around here get lost in a partisan theological fog and make clear why they're important, how to represent American interests and not the narrow, the theological, the partisan that get us bogged down. Mr. Speaker, I hope that members will listen to groups like our public broadcasting supporters and the Garden Club about simple, common-sense approaches to support fundamental American values and get off the, the partisan merry-go-round. We should listen to them. We should work with them. America will be a better place, and so will Congress. Thank you, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Lance, for five minutes. I rise today to celebrate the centennial of the birth of First Lady Patricia Nixon. The Nixon Library in Southern California will present a major exhibit about Mrs. Nixon's life opening March 16th. And the National Archives here in Washington will host a forum on Mrs. Nixon's work in the international arena in April. Thelma Catherine Ryan was born on the eve of St. Patrick's Day on March 16, 1912 in Ely, Nevada, a mining town. 
Her father, William Ryan, called her his St. Patrick's babe in the morn. So she was called Pat within hours of her birth. The Ryans moved to Southern California for a better life and settled on a small truck farm in Artesia near Los Angeles. Orphaned early, her mother, Kate Halberstad Bender Ryan, died in 1924, and her father in 1929, the year she was graduated from high school. A young person of tremendous courage and determination, Mrs. Nixon had her heart set on higher education and worked continually to secure the necessary funds. She drove an elderly couple to the East Coast and worked as an X-ray technician in New York. Returning west, she was graduated cum laude from the University of Southern California in 1937. While attending USC, she held part-time jobs on campus and was a department store sales clerk and a Hollywood extra, appearing in several motion pictures, including the 1935 film Becky Sharp. Mrs. Nixon taught at Whittier High School in the late 1930s, where she met her husband, who had returned to his hometown to practice law after graduating from Duke Law School. Patricia Ryan and Richard Nixon were married in 1940, and, as was true of so many couples their age, she worked here at home while her husband served in the military in World War II as a naval officer in the Pacific. Mrs. Nixon campaigned with her husband as he was elected to the House of Representatives in 1946 and 1948 and to the United States Senate in 1950. There is a charming photograph of the Nixons with their infant daughter, Tricia, taken at the tidal basin with the cherry blossoms in bloom in the spring of 1947. Julie, their younger daughter, was born the following year. With her husband's election as vice president on Dwight Eisenhower's ticket in 1952, Mrs. Nixon became the second lady of the land. The Nixons traveled extensively, including for more than two months in Asia and the Pacific in 1953, and to South America in 1958, where the couple demonstrated tremendous courage in Caracas while being attacked by a communist mob, and to the Soviet Union in 1959. Mrs. Nixon campaigned gallantly in 1960, returning to private life in California and then New York, and proudly held the Nixon family Bible when Richard Nixon was inaugurated the 37th president in 1969. During the presidential years, the First Lady was truly our ambassador of goodwill, visiting South Vietnam, an active combat zone in 1969, an earthquake ravaged Peru in 1970, and China in the groundbreaking trip of 1972. Mrs. Nixon was responsible for the gift from the Chinese of the two giant pandas to the American people. She traveled to more than 80 countries and five continents during her life. As First Lady, Mrs. Nixon encouraged volunteer service, the spirit of people helping people. She added 600 paintings and antiques to the White House collection, illuminated the White House at night, and opened the White House gardens to the public. Mrs. Nixon's service to the nation extended over many years. Only Dolly Madison, Eleanor Roosevelt, and Hillary Clinton, among our First Ladies, have served the country as long as Patricia Nixon. Laid to rest in 1993 on the grounds of the Nixon Library at Yorba Linda, California, Mrs. Nixon grave, graves, Mrs. Nixon's grave marker reads, even when people can't speak your language, they can tell if you have love in your heart. Patricia Ryan Nixon had love in her heart, and now, at her 100th birthday, we remember her for her devotion to family, her grace and perseverance, and her patriotism to the United States of America. Mr. Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Boswell, for five minutes. Without objection. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, today I stand before the 112th Congress to recognize and honor Mr. Stanley E. Peterson for his 40 years of service to the United States as an officer in the United States Navy and as a supervisor in the Federal Bureau of Investigation and as the Chief of Police in Youngstown, Ohio. My intention is to enter into the Congressional record 
the true history of this great American patriot and dismiss the lies and innuendos told by the expelled former member dismissed by the 107th Congress for his conviction in federal court of taking bribes and kickbacks. Stanley E. Peterson was the youngest recruit to the Federal Bureau of Investigation under Director J. Edgar Hoover in 1947. Like his fellow special agents, he lived his life according to the motto of the FBI, fidelity, bravery, and integrity, and its core values, rigorous obedience to the Constitution of the United States, respect for the dignity of those protected, compassion, fairness, uncomprom uncompromising personal integrity, and institutional integrity. Accountability by accepting responsibility for his actions and decisions, as well as consequences for his actions and decisions. Leadership, both personal and professional. Stan Peterson, he was often called Stan, was an intelligent, disciplined, legendary investigator, renowned for his likability and tenacity in his work. When organized crime and its surrogates asked him, attacked him, excuse me, attacked him, he did not compromise. Instead, he protected ongoing investigations, remaining loyal to the core values of the FBI up to the day he died, December 31, 2001, in Des Moines, Iowa. Stanley Ellsworth Peterson was born on July 24, 1923, to Eben Caleb and Ludie Strandquist Peterson in Glencoe, Minnesota. His grandparents and their cousins immigrated from Sweden before the turn of the century, looking for opportunities in the United States. Like so many others, the Peterson family struggled during the Great Depression in southern Minnesota. His father, an honored combat veteran of World War I, farmed and drove a delivery truck to keep his family from receiving welfare. His mother taught him humility, honesty, faithfulness, and to always do his best. Work hard, never quit, and to be charitable. Stan was brilliant in his studies, graduating from Glencoe High School at the age of 16, an adventurous, working for a traveling circus as a bookkeeper during the summer months. He attended and received his diploma from Gustavus Adolphus College, St. Peter, Minnesota, but after the attack on Pearl Harbor, December the 7th, 1941, he enlisted in the U.S. Navy and was sent to Columbia University for midshipman training, during earning the rank of ensign. He served in the U.S. Navy during World War II in the Pacific aboard LST-711. By the end of the war, he was the youngest ensign to Captain LST-911. After World War II, Stan Peterson was selected to join the FBI and married Catherine Rose Thomas. His first assignment as a special agent was Richland, Washington, the home of the Manhattan Project facility. In 1947, Richland was federally controlled was a federally controlled atomic energy top secret community with restricted access. access. Remarkably, even their mail was postmarked Seattle to avoid identification. After one year, he was transferred to Chicago, then Cleveland, and eventually Youngstown, Ohio, the bedlam of organized crime infamous for gangland slayings, illegal gambling, and corruption throughout the city government and the judicial system. In 1961, the United States Attorney General, Robert Kennedy, directed J. Edgar Hoover and the Department of Justice to take action, initiating the war on organized crime. Stan Peterson became the agent in charge of the expanding regional FBI office with direct communication with the director and the Attorney General. And during his assignment, he received several letters of commendation for his crime-fighting achievements. After an unprecedented 20 years at the same assignment, he was transferred to Memphis, Tennessee, a few years before his retirement from the FBI in 1975. A few years later, Youngstown Mayor Philip Ritchie asked Stanley Peterson to become chief of police. This was the first time in the city's history that a chief would be appointed from outside of the department. As a matter of fact, the succeeding mayor, based upon Peterson's record, asked him to remain as chief, charging him to stamp out corruption both on city streets and within, within City Hall. Stan Peterson withstood police strikes, vigilantism, personal attacks from all sides as the former G-man fought crime. As a result of Peterson's actions, the county sheriff signed a confession for taking bribes, and city workers, judges, and politicians were convicted of federal crimes. 
In the midst of these events, the local newspaper did not recognize the achievements or, nor investigate, but rather chose to parrot cacophony from organized crime fighters and their surrogates. After eight years, Stanley Peterson retired as chief of police and eventually was asked to join an investigation with a former U.S. attorney into monopolies involving the railroads and trucking industry. At his funeral, he was remembered for his living example of a man who prioritized his life by his dedication and relationship with God, his wife and family. He is, re he is remembered today for his integrity and service to our nation. In closing, I am pleased to note that Stan's son, Dr. Gregory Peterson, and his beautiful wife, Ramona, are in the gallery. And I'm happy that Dr. Peterson is present as we honor and enter into the record the memory and history of this great American patriot, Stanley D. Peterson. And I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With Michigan's unemployment rate consistently higher than the national average, I remain committed to thoroughly reviewing the implications of burdensome regulations that have the potential to overwhelm my state's and country's job creators. A current effort by the Department of Labor is a new standard being considered by Occupational Safety and Health Administration called the Injury and Illness Prevention Program, or I2P2. The standard will require all employers to implement safety and health programs to, quote, find and fix all hazards in their workplace, even those not otherwise regulated. This regulation could potentially impact every employer covered by OSHA, unless OSHA exempts small employers or those with less hazardous workplaces. Many employers who voluntarily issued safety and health programs have improved their workplace's safety culture, but there are serious problems about this standard that OSHA has not addressed. The moment this regulation gets issued, safety and health programs will go from being a good idea to a legal requirement, which means employers will have to meet OSHA's standards rather than what works best for them and their employees and what is indicated as best in best practices. OSHA will have the authority to come in and second guess an employer about how well they have implemented their program. Not surprisingly then, job creators see the I2P2 regulation as just another OSHA enforcement tool rather than something that will help them enhance their safety practices. But they're not the only ones. A recent RAND study found that California's I2P2 regulation, which has been in place since 1991, has not prevented, and let me say that again, has not prevented workplace fatalities and barely made a dent in total injury prevention. Many job creators are worried that OSHA will double dip on citations, issuing one citation for a hazard and another citation because the safety and health program failed to detect and correct the hazard. Talk about double jeopardy. Finally, another problem is whether employers will be required to find and fix ergonomics hazards. The Clinton administration issued an ergonomics regulation in 2000 that was shot down, thankfully, by Congress. OSHA will soon hold a small business panel to ask job creators across the country their opinion and insight on I2P2. I hope the Obama administration, against its pattern, listens to the concerns of these business owners. Instead of imposing a costly regulation that we have proof will not improve worker safety, imposing a new and costly safety and health program standard will only serve to increase OSHA enforcement with no visible improvement to worker safety and health. As Ronald Reagan once said, it's not my intention to do away with government. It's rather to make it work for us, not over us, to stand by our side, not right on our back. It's my hope we remain committed to this principle and ensure that regulations ensure both productivity and job creation and true health and safety of our workforce. Mr. Speaker, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Chair recognized the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Gutierrez, for five minutes.
As my colleagues know, Latinos are America's fastest growing population. So if you are a presidential candidate and you want to make sure that every single Latino in America knows you strongly oppose sensible and fair immigration reform, you have to work pretty hard at it. It takes a lot of time and determination. After all, the Latino population increased more than 40% between 2000 and 2010. A lot more Latinos, a lot more Latino citizens, and a lot more Latino voters. And a lot of us live in swing states. We're about 30% of the population in Arizona, about 25% in Colorado, Florida, and Nevada. Indiana alone has 350,000 Latinos. Not so many, you say. But when you remember that President Obama only won Indiana by 26,000 votes in 2008, his Latino support was the margin of victory. The truth is we're growing everywhere. One-fourth, one-quarter of all the children in America are Latino. 500,000 Latinos turn 18, and they all become eligible to vote every year. More than 50 million Latinos live in America. Most of them, 9 out of 10, nearly 9 out of 10, are citizens of the United States. 50 million is a lot of people to keep track of, especially if you want to offend each and every one of them. But that is apparently what Mitt Romney is trying to accomplish, to appeal to the most extreme elements of his party. Last week, he called Arizona's harsh immigration law a model for America. Well, he's partially right. Arizona's anti-immigration law is definitively a model. It's just not a model for immigration policy, but it's a model for an awful lot of other things. Let's just count them. One, if you're a politician, Arizona's law is a model for how to achieve early retirement. State Senator Russell Pierce was an author and lead sponsor of Arizona's draconian anti-immigration law. He talked about little else. His constituents weren't pleased, though. So Senator Pierce became the first state legislator in Arizona history, in the history of Arizona, to be recalled from office. The biggest backer of Mitt Romney's immigration model is now unemployed. Two, if you want to wreck your local economy, Arizona's law is a model for lost jobs and tax revenue. The purchasing power of Latinos in Arizona in 2009 was nearly $35 billion. That's right, billion dollars. One study estimated that undocumented immigrants alone paid $443 million in local taxes. Another study estimates that Arizona would lose nearly 150,000 jobs if all undocumented workers were removed from the state. Three, Arizona's law is a model for how to energize Latino voters. In 2004, George W. Bush, when running for president, received nearly 45% of the Latino vote in Arizona. That's pretty good. How did anti-immigrant Jan Brewer do for governor in 2010, two years later? More than 70% of the Latino voters voted against her. But wait, in 2011, Hispanic voter mobilization led to the election of two Latinos to the Phoenix City Council for the first time ever represented in that city council. And in Daniel Valenzuela's district, Latino voter turnout increased fivefold, 500 percent. Four, and I'll stop at four because my time is limited. Arizona's law is a model for how to make decent people suffer. Alabama, following Arizona model, and a, where a judge advised a woman facing domestic abuse that if she sought a restraining order against her abuser husband, she would be asked to prove her immigration status and face deportation while her husband laughed. In both Arizona and Alabama, citizens and legal immigrants have been harassed and detained because they look suspicious or cannot immediately prove their citizenship. I could go on about the human toll. So let's review. Mitt Romney's Model for America has an author that was kicked out of office, means lost jobs and tax revenues for everyone, not just immigrants, has mobilized Latino voters and pushed them away from the Republican Party, and has caused good, hardworking people, immigrants and not immigrants alike, documented and undocumented, to live in fear. Maybe Mitt Romney and I have a different idea of what model means. Maybe he thinks Bernie Madoff is a model investment banker or advisor. But I think model means something you can be proud of, something that makes America better and stronger, more just 
and fair, something that shows America the way to the future. By that standard, Arizona's law is a perfect model. It shows America exactly the policy to avoid on immigration, and it shows Americans exactly the type of candidate to avoid for President of the United States. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Kravak, for five minutes. About 450 U.S. soldiers, sailors, and pilots received the nation's highest combat award during World War II. One of them was a former soldier from West Duluth, Minnesota, who earned the medal during closing days of the war. Michael Caleo was born on December 1, 1925, in Hibbing, Minnesota, the son of an Italian immigrant father who worked in the iron mines. Michael was one of nine children, and in 18, he was drafted to the United States Army. While on April 7, 1945, a month before the war in Europe ended, Kaleo's unit came under heavy fire in a small rural town in Germany. Pinned on the ground, Kaleo and his fellow soldiers were in a death trap. Lying on the ground, bullets and shells flying everywhere, Kaleo decided something had to be done, and he was the guy that had to do it. Even though he was a private and not in command, Kaleo rose up and yelled to the other soldiers to follow his lead. Inspired by his competence, the soldiers advanced in the face of savage enemy fire. When Kaleo stood up that fateful day, he marched forward into America's military history. Mr. Kaleo surged towards the Germans, firing his submachine gun until it was knocked out of his hands by shrapnel. He then ran toward an American tank to take control of the machine gun mounted on its cannon turret. Bullets clanged off the tank's armor and zipped by his body as Mr. Kaleo responded to the onslaught of German enemy fire. It was a rough time, and I was scared, Mr. Kaleo said, but I had to do what I had to do. Mr. Kaleo blasted at one enemy position with such devastating accuracy, the Medal of Honor citation read that he killed or wounded 25 German soldiers and silenced a machine gun nest. After this gun jammed, Mr. Kaleo dismounted from the tank and grabbed another submachine gun to continue his assault on foot. When ordered to withdraw, Mr. Kaleo stayed behind and carried a wounded soldier over his shoulder through open enemy terrain while artillery and mortar rounds pulverized the ground around him. A few weeks later, he was approached by two military police officers who escorted him to a nearby headquarters. He was informed that the tank's commander had nominated him for the Medal of Honor, which he received on December 1945 at a White House ceremony. In an interview in 2008, with the 100th Infantry Division Association newsletter, Kaleo recalled that the good Lord was with me during that battle. I could see our guys getting shot. I could see the muzzle flashes of the Germans at us. I aimed at them. Mr. Kaleo died on December 30th at a nursing home facility in Duluth, Minnesota. He was 86 years old. Mr. Kaleo survived by his son Al of Hayward, Wisconsin, and his daughter Michelle of Meadowlands, Minnesota. In Minnesota, we have a track record of military excellence. According to the Medal of Honor Society, 46 Minnesotans have received our nation's highest award for bravery. And in the 8th District, we honor those who have served. For Michael Calileo, the Medal of Honor Park in Duluth bears his name. We are forever grateful for his service to our great country. Thank you, Mr. Calileo. You make us all proud to be Americans. May God's peace be with you. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Chair recognized the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. McGovern, for five minutes. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, once again, the world is standing by, silent and passive, while the government of Sudan wages war on its own people. We have been here before, when hundreds of thousands of people perished in Darfur be before the international community finally woke up and took action to try to protect innocent civilians from their own government's brutality. The humanitarian crisis continues in Darfur. There is no peace, and villagers, refugees, and humanitarian personnel still live and work under constant peril of attack. President Bashir has expelled many humanitarian workers from Darfur, and even today threatens to shut down their life-saving operations. 
Last May, we witnessed the ruthless, ruthless ethnic cleansing of Abai by the Sudanese people. More than 100,000 people of the Dinka indigenous population were forcibly displaced. They fled to South Sudan seeking safe haven, where they remain today in very, very poor conditions. When Sudanese President Bashir saw that the world was indifferent to this brutal assault, he began military operations in June against insurgents in South Kordofan and more generally against the Nuba people. And still the world stood silent. So in September, Khartoum launched attacks on another border region. This time the state of Blue Nile was under siege with attacks by the Sudanese army and bombings of civilians. Thousands fled to the neighboring countries of Ethiopia and South Sudan for safety, joining the desperate refugees from South Kordofan. And so Sudan has undertaken a bloodbath against its own people in the states of South Kordofan and Blue Nile. House to house arrests and killings, rape, the merciless bombings of civilians. For nearly eight months, Khartoum has blocked all humanitarian aid to South Kordofan and Blue Nile. And it has not only continued to bomb in those states, it has crossed the border and bombed refugee camps in towns inside South Sudan where tens of thousands had hoped to find food and shelter. Here are some photos uh, of some people in refugee camps in South Sudan. Salah Kora uh, is from the Angolo tribe in South Kordofan. The government dropped bombs on her fields when she was trying to plant. And then, and, and then the government dropped six bombs on her village. This poor woman here grabbed her children and hid in a nearby ditch. After the bombing stopped, Sudanese soldiers moved into the village and burned several homes. When they began shooting people, Salah ran and hid with her children. The soldiers didn't care if you were an unarmed civilian, a woman, or a child. She fled with her children ac across the border in January to the Yida refugee camp in South Sudan. This woman, this woman over here, to my far right, and her little girl are from the Nuba Mountains. She is married to a man who fled the nightmare of Darfur in 2005. Both were suffering from malnutrition when they arrived at the refugee camps. The people of South Kordofan and Blue Nile are being subjected to bombing, murder, rape, scorched earth, and starvation. This should come as no surprise when Ahmad Haroun, the Sudanese official wanted by the International Criminal Court for Crimes Against Humanity in Darfur, um, is, uh, is now the governor of South Kordofan. Mr. Speaker, we are fast approaching the month of March, the point at which the Famine Early Warning Systems Network, or FUSENET, has predicted that South Kordofan and Blue Nile will reach emergency levels of food insecurity. This is just one level short of all-out famine. And yet, Khartoum still denies food and medical relief to the suffering people of these regions. Last week, the United Nations Security Council called on the Sudanese government and the armed rebels to allow unhindered access for humanitarian aid and for both sides to return to talks and cease host hostilities. President Bashir said no. The United States and the international community, including China, Russia, and others, must increase the pressure on Sudan to allow the delivery of aid to the suffering people of South Kordofan and Blue Nile and to reach agreement on a ceasefire. The safety and security of the Sudanese people, whether in Darfur, Abaye, South Kordofan, Blue Nile, or elsewhere, must be our first priority. Mr. Speaker, we have been silent for too long. I yield back my time. Gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Duncan, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to recognize an exceptional group of students, teachers, and parents of the Bell Street Middle School Science Olympiad team, which just won its 10th consecutive Science Olympiad state championship. Let me repeat that. 10th consecutive Science Olympiad championship. This program, the Science Olympiad program, is one of the premier science competitions in the nation, providing rigorous standards-based challenges to nearly 6,200 teams in 50 states. 
Science Olympiad's continuously changing event lineup exposes students to a variety of career choices and gives them an opportunity to meet participating and practicing scientists, as well as the opportunity to have life-changing mentors. Science Olympiad was founded in 1982, and Bell Street Middle School there in Clinton, South Carolina, began competing in that in 1986. The Science Olympiad team at Bell Street was formed by three very inspirational teachers, Rosemary Wickard, Dr. David O'Shields, who's a close personal friend, and Michael Mack. Mr. Mack and Dr. O'Shields still work in the school district uh, in Clinton today. Michael Mack is a member of the science faculty at Clinton High School, and Dr. David O'Shields is currently the superintendent of Lawrence County School District 56. Both continue to be active event coaches for the incredibly successful Bell Street Science Olympiad team. Many of the Bell Street Middle School Science Olympiad alumni have gone on to become extremely successful in the areas of science and technology. Some examples. One is the um, gentleman, Diedrich Carter. Diedrich was a former member of the Bell Street Middle School Science Olympiad team who went on to enroll in MIT for college. He later became uh, MIT's assistant dean for engineering and a lecturer in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. He is currently the senior advisor for strategic initiatives to the director of the National Science Foundation. Another one, Jarrett Campbell is also an alum of Bell Street Middle School's Science Olympiad team and after competing in the Science Olympiad teams in middle and high school, Jared went on to complete a doctorate degree in chemical engineering from the University of Texas at Austin. Jared worked for Advanced Micro Devices where he was awarded over 25 patents in the area of semiconductor manufacturing technology and today Jared works as a global energy management specialist for the U.S. company in Paris, France. When he was asked about his experience with the Science Olympiad, Dr. Campbell said this, not only did the teacher coaches and parent volunteers pique my interest in science and math, they continually challenged me to expand my knowledge by competing in new disciplines. Looking back, I see how important the camaraderie, teamwork, and constant desire to excel, along with the examples set by these role models leading the team, was in, it, was, it was exceptional in setting the stage for my career in engineering and energy management. I believe this statement sums up how valuable this program is to our nation's youth. So finally, I would like to take time to congratulate all the coaches, member of this year's state championship science Olympiad team uh, from District 56's uh, Bell Street Middle School. This year's team included Mike Beasley, Stephanie Braswell, uh, Jaylon Carter, Lawrence Coleman, Terry Craig, Andrew Gann, Carl Gustafson, Dalton Langston, Beth Metter, Zach Ray, Jonathan Shiflett, Kyle Smith, Bowen Tiller, Nathan Vondergeest, Clay Wright, Tristan Moon, Daniel Moore, Luke Reagan, Jacob Wesson, Audrey Atkinson, Chris Cannon, Justin Easter, Dalston Green, Jack Harkins, Tara Hiller, Amy Metters, Jill Metters, Olivia Moore, uh, Brianna Mott, Jacob Pountain, Michael Ritchie, Justin Shockley, Dylan Sneed, and Bailey Stevens. And those are the students, but the teachers and the, and the parents that volunteer need to be uh, singled out as well. I don't have them by name, but let them know that we certainly appreciate their efforts. These are the future scientists. These are the new innovators coming along. I'm excited that at middle school, they're challenging these students to be the best they can. So may God continue to bless those students, teachers, parents. May God continue to bless Bell Street Middle School. And may God continue to bless America. And I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Woolsey, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's February the 29th, a date that exists only once every four years. And yet, this is the third. February 29th, the third leap day that we've been at war in Afghanistan. I have my granddaughter here with me. She's eight years old. She's not lived in the United States when we were not at war. Last week, in particular, we were exposed to the grave dangers and the fundamental flaws of our Afghanistan strategy. The week started with the burning, accidentally, of several copies of the Koran by U.S. troops. That sparked days of violence, protests, 
throughout the country. Angry Afghanistans tried to storm UN compounds and other uh, Western installations. At our largest military base, thousands, including many who work at the base, many who worked at the base, gathered to throw rocks and shout death to America. Days later came the killing of two NATO soldiers shot in the back of the head while working at their desks inside the Afghan Interior Ministry. The killer was apparently a Taliban insurgent who had infiltrated the uh, government security forces and penetrated what is supposed to be one of the most secure buildings in Kabul. It's clear, Mr. Speaker, that police officers, the ones we're supporting and training to keep militants at bay, are losing patience with our continued military occupancy of their country. One of them told the Washington Post, and I, I quote, he said, Afghans and the world's Muslims should rise against the foreigners. We have no patience left. We will attack the military foreign people, unquote. In response to all of this, General John Allen has ordered the removal of all NATO personnel from Afghan government ministries and in and around Kabul. And out in the field, some U.S. soldiers have been instructed not to engage too directly with Afghan security forces, even though the training of these forces is at the heart of our very mission in Afghanistan. Mr. Speaker, can there be any doubt, any doubt, given what's happened over the last week or so and the last 10 years, that our 10-year military occupation is losing, not winning over there? The hearts and the minds of the Afghanis Afghanis have been lost to the United States. The amazing thing is there's talk at the re recent unrest, that the recent unrest might delay the withdrawal of our troops from Afghanistan. Delay the withdrawal of our troops from Afghanistan. If anything, we need to accelerate that withdrawal. It's this war that has sown the seeds of resentment and mistrust. It's this war that has increased instability and strengthened the insurgency. It's this war that is fraying the partnership and heightened the tensions. So, Mr. Speaker, what if we engage Afghanistan in a different way, peacefully rather than forcibly, not in war? What if we sent, at a fraction of the cost, I might add, pennies on the dollar, I might add, what if we sent civilian experts to help rebuild Afghanistan and invest in its people? What if we focused on humanitarian, humanitarian aid instead of military aggression? That's the smart security philosophy that I've been advocating for many years now. I'm convinced that such an approach would show the way to greater peace, greater security, and prosperity in Afghanistan. We can't begin to do this soon enough. Despite everything that's happened, not just this past week, but over the last decade, the Pentagon continues to tell us the Afghanistan strategy, strategy is sound and it is succeeding. Do they think we're not paying attention? It couldn't be clearer that what we're doing isn't working. It's time for smart security, Mr. Speaker. It's time to bring our troops home. And the time is now. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Poe, for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, the country cannot afford the great ruler, his administration, and especially his policies. He costs too much, he spends too much, he blames others too much, he violates the Constitution too much, he blames George Bush too much. He infringes on religious liberty too much. He ignores our border security too much. He divides the people too much. 
He refuses to assume responsibility too much. He misleads the poor too much. He sues states too much. He refuses to compromise too much. He blames the rich too much. He subsidizes failed green energy projects too much. He encourages people to depend on the government too much. He vilifies capitalism too much. He preaches government intervention too much. He regulates too much. He campaigns too much. He blames businesses too much. He blames George Bush too much. He taxes too much. He punishes people who pay taxes too much. And he promises free stuff to non-taxpayers too much. He likes the word debt too much. He regulates our lives too much. He likes big government too much. He blames oil companies too much. He, his budget hurts veterans too much. He likes high gasoline prices too much. He blocks offshore drilling too much. He stonewalls domestic energy too much. He gambles taxpayer money on unproven energy projects too much. He sends money to countries who hate us too much. He despises the Keystone XL pipeline too much. He apologizes for America too much. He blames George Bush too much. He cuts benefits to our veterans too much. He blames the Tea Party too much. And he blames Congress too much. He preaches America's best days are behind us too much. He blames conservatives too much. He likes the word czar too much. He turns his back on Israel too much. He treats our enemies better than our friends too much. He blames our problems on Greece too much. He blames our problems on the Europeans too much. He ignores individual freedom too much. He's anti-free market too much. He cuts defense spending too much. He infringes on personal liberty too much. He has to have it his way too much. He tramples on states' rights too much. He blames Congress too much. He blames George Bush too much. And he really, really, really despises Texas too much. Mr. Speaker, we no longer can afford the great ruler, his administration, and especially his policies. And that's just the way it is. Gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Thompson, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise uh, today. I rise to recognize Sherry Steinbeiser for decades of service to the communities of northwestern Pennsylvania. On June 25, 2011, Sherry was elected to a one-year term as pre president of the Ladies Auxiliary to the Department of Pennsylvania Veterans of Foreign Affairs, Foreign Wars, the VFW. Like every task, Sherry has has taken on in her long career service. Her primary goal as president has been serving others. Joining the Ladies Auxiliary in 1996, Sherry is a life member of Cleo Bargerstock Auxiliary 1424 in Marionville, Pennsylvania, which is located within the Pennsylvania 5th Congressional District. Outside of the Auxiliary, Sherry has worked for more than 30 years as a licensed practical nurse. She's volunteered her spare time as an emergency medical technician and serves as a board member of a group called Experience Incorporated, a local organization in Warren and Forest Counties dedicated to providing services to elderly citizens. Albert Einstein once said, only a life lived for others is worth living. A model citizen that has committed her life to serving others, I believe Sherry would agree. Thank you for your service, Sherry. Mr. Speaker, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Olson, for five minutes.
I thank the speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I rise to give the American people an update on the Keystone XL pipeline. Monday, President Obama took the first step to get out of the way and bring tar sands oil from Canada to my home, southeast Texas. It's the yellow pipeline line here on this chart. The administration agreed to build the first segment from Cushing, Oklahoma, right here to southeast Texas, the port of Houston and the port of Port Arthur. In announcing the administration's change position, White House spokesman Jay Carney said, and this is a quote, moving oil from the Midwest to the world-class state-of-the-art refineries on the Gulf Coast will modernize our infrastructure, create jobs, and encourage American energy production. Amen. 438 miles down, 1,223 to go. But there is no new oil with this pipeline being built. None. So Houston, we still have a problem. And that problem is exploding prices for gasoline. Since the day President Obama took office, He took office on January 20th, 2009. Since that time, gasoline prices have doubled from 184, I'm sorry, $1.84 per gallon to over $3.70 per gallon. Doubled. This hits Texas families hard. If you have a pickup truck with a 24-gallon gas tank and fill it up every two weeks, that's $90 increase in gas expenses per month. There it goes. The $1,000 every American got by the payroll tax cut extension, something we fought for two months here in Congress, just thrown away. In a speech in Miami, our president said that there was, quote, no magic bullet, unquote, to lower gas prices. And there's some truth to that statement. The president is limited in what he can do to lower gas prices, but there's a lot a president can do to increase gas prices. And unfortunately, President Obama's policies have put us on a path to the worst summer for gas prices in our country's history. We enter this summer with the highest gas prices in our country's history at this time of the year. They're only going to go up. The president had a knee-jerk reaction to the Gulf of Mexico to spill there. He shut the Gulf down for nearly a year. That's at least 10 American rigs that left the Gulf for overseas, taking American energy with them and American jobs. He chose Hollywood elites and radical environmentalists over American unions and the American people by putting the Keystone Pipeline in limbo. And while a small portion of the 20,000 jobs the full pipeline would have created are going to be kept by the, this new decision, 4,000 of them, um, we still have no new oil. 80,000 barrels a day flowing through the Keystone XL pipeline is not going to happen. We're just basically building another lane on the freeway. And the most alarming thing to me is the Obama administration has spent three years watching Iran export terror and developing their own nuclear weapons to destroy Israel. And now that the House and Senate, followed by the European Union, have imposed sanctions on Iran over their nuclear ambitions, the Iranians are threatening to shut down the Strait of Hormuz. This is a map of the Strait of Hormuz. And as a former naval aviator who deployed for six months to the region in 1994 and flew low-level missions through the Strait, I can tell you that the Iranian threat to shut it down is real, very real. It's a narrow body of water, 
30 miles wide at some points. It's worse because, you can, as you can see, the sea lanes where the ships go through, the commerce goes through, are very close to Iran. This island over here, Abu Musa, that is an Iranian military base. There's an old saying that a picture is worth a thousand words. And this is our president as a candidate in 2007 at a gas station in 2008 in Indianapolis. What's missing?